So <coughs> our next speaker is Charles uh, from <coughs> Seattle, University of Washington. And he's going to be talking, he's sort of expend, ex expending a little bit more time on the dark side, but this time focusing on the kappa opiate receptor, which has a lot of parallels with the um, CRF system and overlapping, and is regulated heavily after um, drug use. So, Charles, Thanks. where are you going? Thanks. I so really appreciate the opportunity to come. I always enjoy these discussions because of the format of these sessions are, are so interactive. And it's really, um, I learn a lot from the other speakers. I learn a lot from each of the uh, <laughs> questions. So please interrupt as much as you can because it helps me a lot in what I'm trying to do. In a course on addiction, of course, one of the topics that we would want to consider is what are the risk factors? There's a little a discussion about risk factors for addiction, but when I think about the risk factors that, that have been identified, they would be uh, genetic, that people are different in their genes and what, what risk they bring from their genes. They differ in their opportunity, their social environment, what are available or what drugs are available. Access to drugs are, is a big issue. But one of the risk factors that I think have been brought out in a number of research laboratories repeatedly is this concept of risk as a risk factor for, I'm uh, sorry, stress as a risk factor for addiction. George Koob talked about that a little bit yesterday because what he was <laughs> saying was that exposure to drug disrupts the stress system, but clearly individuals under stress react very differently to medicate to drugs that we would we would all uh, call addictive. And I think we can all relate to that. You imagine what it would be like to go on a on a Friday out drinking with your friends at a bar. If the week has been wonderful, your grant was was awarded, your paper was accepted, that alcohol it's very different than if your grant was rejected, your girlfriend ran off with somebody else, your experiments couldn't work. Same pharmacology, same medication, the drug feels really different. And what we believe is that if we can get an identification of the risk factors for addiction and approach ameliorations, we might be able to um, develop therapeutics that could help protect people by making them more stress resilient. So I got into this topic of understanding stress as a risk factor for addiction, and I want to spend a little bit of time in this course talking about what we know about them. George talked a little bit about how the dark side, where the stress hormones really come in as a way to initiate uh, drug seeking and craving. He talked a little bit about that and mentioned dynorphin yesterday. But what I want to focus in part one of this uh, session is that what we've learned about the dynorphin peptides in the kappa opioid systems as the evildoers in the Kube's dark side story that you, you, you heard about. They're the evil evildoers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, dynorphins. They've got a fairly long history. The endogenous opioid peptides were first described in the 1970s. The concept that there were endogenous molecules that could be working on the uh, morphine receptors was a, a novel concept at the time. There was not a lot of history of neuropeptide transmitters, and so whole disciplines emerged in the discovery of neuropeptides as transmitters and the properties. This started in the early 70s when it was, became clear that neuropeptides in kephalin and, and uh, beta-endorphin were uh, important endogenous opioids. <coughs> Goldstein, who was my thesis advisor, first detected dynorphin in pituitary extracts. It was uh, isolated, sequenced, and then Numa uh, took the sequences of the peptides and went out and pulled out the genes, so the clones for the genes were identified. And what we know about the peptides is that the precursor polypeptide, prodynorphin, actually has three copies of a dynorphin-like sequence that are flanked by basic residues that are cleaved to make active molecules, neoendorphin, dynorphin A, and dynorphin B, they share a similar structure. This is the single letter amino acid code for neoendorphin, uh, dynorphin A and dynorphin B. And those of you who are used to seeing this recognize that the first five amino acids are the same as leucine and kephalin, tyroglyglyphi lu, with a carboxy terminal extension that's, that's highly basic. And one of the projects that I, I first did was to discover that these dynorphins have basic residues in the C-terminal extension that confer kappa opioid selectivity in bioassays. So these are kappa opioid peptides. I'll talk about dynorphins as a class, but I'm really talking about these molecules and their ability 
to interact with the kappa opioid receptors. So pharmacologically, they show a great deal of binding affinity, good selectivity for the kappa opioid receptors in pharmacologic assays. And the question then is, what do they do in vivo? Are they the natural? What does it mean to be a neuropeptide transmitter? Is a neuropeptide transmitter, just like glutamine GABA, fast-acting transmitters, we know a lot about the neuromuscular junction. What are the properties of neuropeptides as transmitters? When we think about the way the brain is organized and we understand that neuropeptides are important signaling molecules, what are the qualities of the signaling that these molecules have? So when I first set up my own lab, I set up a lab built around the idea that we would understand what neuropeptides do as signaling molecules. And I showed you a picture of the hippocampus. Let me go back to that to show you again. This is the guinea pig hippocampus. This is dynorphin B immunostaining. The dentate granule cells, which are in this lighter, clearer layer here, labeled G, have in their axons a uh, strong amount of dynorphin immunoreactivity. And so logically, putting a recording electrode in a postsynaptic site, stimulating uh, the axons to release dynorphin, gave us a lot of insight as to under what conditions could dynorphin be released, what would it do when it would uh, be released onto the postsynaptic cell, and uh, there's a lot of very productive work that, that took about 10, 15 years that I'm summarizing onto one slide for you. So what are the properties of the dynorphin synapse? We need to understand that if we're thinking about the way neuropeptides encode signal messages in the brain and the way in which they're functioning uh, as transmitters. They're processed and packaged in large, dense core vesicles. They're released in calcium-dependent manner following high-frequency stimulation. Because they're not in small, clear vesicles at primed at the synapse the way uh, glutamate and GABA are, uh, they require more calcium entry into the cells, so a higher frequency stimulation is required. Uh, they physiologically activate kappa opioid receptors. So even there's a mismatch between where the highest density of the peptides are and where the highest density of the receptors are, the, the peptides work at the kappa receptors under physiologic conditions. And the high affinity of the peptide for the receptor means that these molecules can act after much dilution. So unlike glutamine and GABA, low affinity at the receptor means that they've got to act locally that you can have dynorphin diffusing some distance before it is too low, too diluted to be able to bind to the receptor. They act in the hippocampus to reduce excitatory neurotransmission. They block LTP, they block epileptogenesis, they reduce excitability. They work on the, on the glutamatergic presynaptic terminal to inhibit um, transmitter release in, in ways that I think are likely to be true broadly throughout the nervous system. The dynorphin kappa system are distributed broadly throughout the nervous system, and it's not just glutamine and GABA that whose release are regulated. A broad range of other transmitters are, are similarly controlled. So, Charlie, the issue of releasing them following high-frequency stimulation, have, have you or anybody done experiments with, like, single fiber stimulation also, with minimal <coughs> stimulation, so that you use low-frequency or high-frequency with oxygenation, for example? You isolate fiber of dynorphin containing neuron. Then you stimulate them with different frequencies and measure for synaptic and receptor responses. So, has that been done? Uh, it, so I did all of this work predating optogenetics. What we did do was, was paired recordings. And, and so in paired recordings, you can do them, but you have to be really careful about getting the plane of section exactly right. And so if you're really careful about that, you can. Most of the work that we did at that time was with buff a bundle stimulation, so a collection of mossy fibers or a collection of, of afferent fibers, we can activate dynorphin release in, in ways that were not one-to-one -one in the way you're speaking about. But under those conditions where we could actually measure it, we could measure, we required higher frequency stimulation in order to be able to see a, a norbionized sensitive synaptic response. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's really fascinating that you are getting such a lust release. Yes. almost like a one-way street because the peptide is not recycled. And so can you do this three or four times in a row? Or when do you run out of peptide? Um, we, we never depleted the peptides in, in our slice recordings. We did slice recordings that would last about 12 hours. So we could do, we could do that repeatedly. We, would be, we wouldn't be giving it an epileptogenic-like stimulation. We'd be giving a pulse of stimulation stop 
pulsar stimulation and stop. We were looking at the ability of dynorphin release to regulate glutamatergic transmission and LTP generation, and under those conditions we could get very stable responses. So I imagine you could exhaust the system by super physiologic stimulation rates, but that isn't what we were exploring. But can you give your high frequency stimulus, say? For a short period of time, like a second, a, a, a second or less than a second. And did it again 10 minutes later? It would be to the same response. We would not be depleting the peptide. Probably a lot of dense corvescals uh, do kiss and run. They don't release all their content. So you get more than one, many, many shots from a single dense corvescal. They, they, in many systems, they have the capacity to do that. Yes. But, yes. But Charlie, so the, 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 you see an ionotropic response in the postsynaptic cells, or you see an effect on release? Um, the receptors that we were looking at in the hippocampus are all presynaptic. So they're on the presynaptic terminals, so we only saw it indirectly. There are other targets where there are somatic receptors. We haven't gone back and actually looked at that, uh, but it would be interesting. In the hippocampus, it's all presynaptic. But there are somatic uh, kappa receptors as well that we may get to someday. Um, so the answer is really um, not perfectly clear, but what, what I believe is happening, uh, let me finish the sentence and then get to the next slide where I talk about that. What was interesting to us is when we were doing these experiments in the slice, that we could measure the kinetics of on and off of the peptide, and using diffusion characteristics that have been described, we could get a rough idea of the dimensions of the neuropeptide synapse, which are large. 50 to 100 microns. These molecules can act in a neurohumeral way, not in an endocrine way. In other words, you wouldn't fill the whole brain up with dynorphin when you released it from the hippocampus, but you could imagine a sphere of tissue that would be regulated in that way. So we could do that by actually electrophysiologically measuring the diffusion uh, in slice. And what we also saw was that it was on a slow scale, time scale. Uh, clearly very different than glutamatergic and GABAergic transmission. And the way we, we think of this as it being able to locally orchestrate the responsivity of a group of, of cells, coordinated uh, in a way that allows that group of cells to act now in a dynorphin tone. I'll tell you more about what that dynorphin tone means, but what it means is that there's a local neurohumoral mechanism for endogenous dynorphin that we can describe in the slice. Okay, so that's about 10 years of work. Another 10 years of work was to express the kappa receptors and, and look at signal transduction events and see what's going on. I think it's very clear that the kappa receptor, oh, uh, these are GIGO coupled pertussis toxin sensitive receptors through a G beta gamma mechanism, activate inwardly rectifying potassium channels activate delayed rectifying potassium channels, and inhibit voltage-sensitive calcium channels. There are also direct effects on the vesicular machinery that people have talked about, where the G-beta-gamma can directly interfere with vesicle fusion. All four of those mechanisms will be effective in reducing uh, transmitter release. And these are described as the membrane-delimited reduction in neuronal excitability. And these are our relatively fast-acting responses on the scales of, of seconds to minutes. When dynorphin is released, this is what happens. But also on a longer time scale, <coughs> the kappa receptors are very good at activating MAP kinases, including turning on ERK, turning on uh, phospho P30, making phospho P38, and activating June kinase. These MAP kinases have a variety of effects that have been described, including changes in gene expression, changes in synaptic plasticity, and changes in the phosphorylation state of a broad range of substrates within the cell, regulating excitability on a longer time scale. Transcription factors, obviously if you change phosphorylation of activation transcription factors, you're changing gene expression that can last uh, weeks, months, a long time, whereas these are events that are over and resolved within a few minutes. Okay, so you get a, a sense of what these systems were doing when dynorphin was released. But is, is, in this slide, is, uh, are those um, ionic effects that you're describing as the plasma membrane, are those, um, are those happening at the presynaptic terminal? 
we obviously we can't measure those directly because we can't impale the presynaptic terminal. We're inferring it based on somatic recordings where there can be changes in calcium conductances that lots of individual labs have studied. Uh, and we infer that similar things are happening at the presynaptic level. We've done a lot of experiments with, with inhibitors and with toxins looking at presynaptic mechanisms, and that would be a whole other talk, or I can send you the papers. What we know is something about the nature of the ion channels and their toxin specificity. For example, in the terminals that I was describing, it's very likely that activation of voltage-gated potassium channels of a dendrotoxin-sensitive nature are important in regulating um, glutamate release in the hippocampus. But that's a different talk. Absolutely, but calcium conductances are important somatically as well because they the calcium entry will regulate other calcium sensitive processes in the cell body. Uh, but, but when you're thinking specifically about what's happening at the presynaptic terminal, it's very clear that activation of voltage sensitive potassium channels shorten the action potential of calcium entry and direct inhibition of the voltage sensitive calcium channels of, of toxin defined types have been described. Uh, and have been have been defined, and and that, but the biophysics of that is really interesting, but not. And I didn't bring slides to, to illustrate that. Other questions about this? Okay. Um, at the same time, we were taking this very reductionist approach. We plural uh, were taking the very reductionist approach. In parallel, there was a strong behavioral pharmacology group looking at what does it mean to activate kappa receptors and what happens with dynorphin or kappa receptors in, in brain. Albert Hertz in, in the mid-80s focused our attention on the dysphoric properties of kappa drugs. As the pharmaceutical companies realized that there were multiple types of receptors, they synthesized more and more selective drugs targeting the kappa receptors, hoping to be able to avoid the addictive properties of mu receptors. And what they found was that they could make analgesic kappa agonists that were highly selective but individuals would complain about a dysphoria, a malaise, a flu-like set of symptoms when they would take cap agonists. And so compliance was a big issue, and the drug companies threw in the towel and said, we're not going to sell these because people won't take them. Um, I don't know how much you know about salvinorin. Uh, salvia divinorin is a herb that's available now. Uh, it's not legislated in, in, in every state yet, and you can chew on it, or if you go on YouTube, you can watch people who chew <laughs> on it. And from what I understand, I haven't, I haven't done this myself, uh, it produces a really intense dysphoric, psychotomimetic experience, and Brian Roth was able to show that it's a highly selective cap agonist. In other words, unlike other hallucinogens like LSD or mescaline, it's highly selective kappa. So what we get clues from the pharmacology of these drugs, that the kappa receptors seem to be really important in cognition, that's hallucinogenic effects, really important in mood, really important in, in analgesic effects. We know that they have important roles in learning and memory and in gut motility. And so we get a clue as to what dynorphin, endogenous dynorphin might be doing by looking at what drugs that activate the same receptor also do. Huda Kiel focused our attention on the role of endogenous opioids in the stress response. It's a really interesting story. They were doing electrical stimulation. They, they were looking at the way in which electrical stimulation could produce stimulation-induced analgesia. And they tried naloxone long before enkephalins or, or, um, or beta endorphins were understood. And they found a naloxone-sensitive stress-induced or electrical stimulation-induced analgesia. And she put her effort into understanding the role of stress uh, and I just wanted to go back one thing to what you were just talking about, hallucinogenic topics. Sure, I'm really fascinated by those. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I don't think you meant to imply that mescaline and LSD activate kappa receptors. No, I did not say that. I didn't mean to say that. Unlike Good. mescaline and, and LSD, right. which act which broadly are... on the serotonergic system, right. Brian Roth expected that salvia divinorin would also be a 5-HT2A agonist. Right. He was surprised to discover that it was only a kappa drug, and mescaline, those others don't. 
Yeah, so that's clearly different. So it's clear that kappa regulates cognition differently than LSD does, but very profound alteration in cognition is evident and is suggesting that dynorphin has a role in a cortical function as well. So thanks for that clarification. Um, Yasmin, getting back to addiction, Yasmin Hurd and Ellen Unterwald focused our attention on how binge cocaine administration causes a big increase in dynorphin message. And, and they speculated that this may be part of a compensatory change in the nervous system so that cocaine, which is a euphorogenic drug, would produce its actions and the body would adapt by increasing the concentration of a compensatory peptide, a dysphoric, to restore the balance. That was a, a speculation based on changes in dynorphin messenger RNA. Tony Schippenberg and Albert Hertz tested that idea and, and showed pharmacologically that just like for humans who report dysphoric properties when they ingest kappa drugs, um, if you inject them into rats or mice, you get a, a place aversion. Very clear, kappa-induced place aversion. Uh, Carla Zone and Nessler put these ideas together and said that dynorphin really functions as an opponent process, similar to the way George was describing yesterday, that they speculated that dynorphin was there to oppose the rewarding effects of cocaine, and that's why it's up. And it's, if you've looked at the anatomy of dynorphin, you can see a really a tremendous amount of dynorphin in the medium spiny neurons, and the concept that medium spiny neuron dynorphin release regulates the, the cocaine effects in the nucleus accumbens really drew their attention. And so those two ideas came together and, and we said, okay, well, if that's true, if dynorphin is really acting to oppose um, cocaine, what if we tried to do a, a place preference experiment? Interesting experiment that we tried to do. You know about place preference. You've heard about it before. But if what we do is train the, the mice to cocaine, we get a nice condition place preference over different sessions, standard way to do it. But if we stressed the mouse before we gave them cocaine, another force, put them in a force swim apparatus for six minutes, and then took them out, dried them off, gave them cocaine, what happened is that they liked the cocaine twice as much as they otherwise would. This really shouldn't have surprised us, but it did. We were predicting that the stress-induced release of dynorphin would block cocaine reward, but in fact, it doubled the, the condition place preference. It shouldn't have been a surprise because as it opened up, stress is uh, known to be able to increase the rewarding effects of the alcohol on Friday that I was talking about or the cocaine experience. And so we see that in our, in our mice. What's, what struck us as really amazing was that when we pretreated the mice with Norby and I before we swam them, we would get a complete block of the cocaine potentiation. That, that really stopped what we were doing and started us thinking about what's going on here. Condition place preference, we could spend the whole week talking about what exactly is going on in the mind of these mice, but what we were trying to understand is what is dynorphin doing here. We were able to replicate this by using a dynorphin knockout. It also completely blocks. We were able to replicate it using a kappa receptor knockout. It, this, the increment caused by stress was a consequence of dynorphin activation of the kappa receptor, and we wanted to understand why. It was opposite of what we were predicting, but and we tried to understand why that would give us the results that we saw. How does stress exposure increase addiction risk? It's a kind of a broadly important question, because if we can actually make individuals stress resilient, we might be able to reduce vulnerable individuals' addiction risk. And can these animal models of addiction risk be validated? Uh, that's a challenge that all of us doing behavioral pharmacology uh, will try to uh, struggle with. Kappa antagonism blocks stress-induced potentiation to cocaine reward, and we wanted to know what are the cellular mechanisms involved, and can those preclinical insights be used to advance therapeutic treatments for addiction? And that's what we've been working on. I'll try to summarize some of that data for you. Now, this isn't data, this is a, a cartoon that illustrates the way we were conceptualizing it. What we imagined is that when the animals were swum, dynorphin release would produce a dysphoric state, and now the rewarding valence of cocaine would be increased. That's shown here as the delta M. Exactly what delta M is, change in mood, we wanted to know what that meant neurochemically. Did that mean there was a change in the actions of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, glutamate? Well, what did that mean? But it was clear that the animal was sensing a change in its mood and the rewarding valence of cocaine 
was increased. Can we test this model experimentally by assessing the dysphoric effects of stress? Uh, the answer is a challenge because it's, it's really uh, hard to do. But what we chose to do is let the animals swim in the presence of an odorant cue, almond scent. And then we put, allowed that animal to, in, in a tea maze to be, approach or not approach a little uh, piece of, of uh, bedding with an almond scent. And in, if the animals weren't uh, have that stress paired with the uh, almond scent, they liked the almond scent compartment as much as the other compartment, and that uh, Norby and I had no effect on that. But if we paired the almond scent with the stress, we got a very robust aversion to the almond scent that was blocked by Norby and I. So we've got a measure now of dysphoria as, as another measure of aversion that we could look at. Uh, did this affect learning and memory? Well, no. If we did the pairing with cocaine, uh, cocaine odor and pairing shows a nice robust place preference, and that Norby and I has no effect on that. Dynorphin knockout blocks it. And if instead of swimming the animals and releasing dynorphin, we just injected the kappa agonist and, and with the odorant Q, we got a nice uh, odorant aversion to a kappa agonist as well. So we can measure dysphoria. Where was this happening? Well, in all of those uh, reductionist studies that I summarized for you, we showed that when you activate the kappa receptors, the receptors become phosphorylated on serine 369. They become phosphorylated uh, by a G-protein receptor kinase, and that's part of the arrest-independent inactivation mechanism for kappa receptors. We made a phosphoselective antibody against that receptor, phosphorylated site, and what we could show is that we could get robust increases shown in green in uh, kappa receptor activation. This has turned out to be a really not, we've been struggling with ways to actually measure dynorphin release. It's hard to do because with dialysis it doesn't work very well. Uh, with our typical radium amino acid sensitivities, they're not sensitive enough to really pick it up at the cellular level. But here we had a tool that would be able to say exactly where was dynorphin acting because we could see where the kappa receptors had been activated and phosphorylated. And these phosphoantibodies have been used in a number of studies to map where uh, this the dynorphin release is. One di quick digression. Originally, when we developed this antibody, we were interested in asking when we stressed the animal, were there specific circuits that were uniquely activated by one stress versus another stress? And the insight that we gained was it didn't matter how you stressed the animal, the, the whole brain lit up. And it's as if the whole brain is a, is a unit, a functioning unit, and a stressed brain works very differently than an unstressed brain. So it's rather than it being stress being just within the hypothalamus, for example, and that's where stress is, it's broad, it's diffuse, and you can see that with the phosphoantibody. Uh, Kub talked yesterday about the relationship between dynorphin and CRF, and, and here's an example of one of the reasons why we think CRF in this circumstance can be upstream and cause the release of dynorphin. When you inject CRF ICV, we get an increase in the phosphorylation of the kappa receptors uh, that's blocked by pretreatment of the animal with Norby and I, missing in a dynorphin knockout, missing in a kappa receptor knockout. So it's clearly CRF can activate dynorphin release, and this is showing uh, activation in the uh, basal lateral amygdala. But as, as George said yesterday, it's very likely that if you were to inject a cap agonist, the dysphoric feeling that the animal has is very likely to also manifest as an increase in CRF release. The link between CRF and dynorphin in the stress system is probably a mutually upstream. If you can the, the phosphorylation, uh, then the residue, is that associated with desensitization or arrested recruitment? Is that what it's Absolutely, absolutely. That's another whole set of stories. Uh, uh, actually, what happens is that the receptor becomes phosphorylated by GRK. It arrestin then becomes activated and binds. The membrane delimited effects of kappa receptor activation are desensitized. But as I'll tell you in a moment, arrestin is a scaffolding molecule that recruits uh, other MAP kinases and activates other MAP kinases. So the answer is really interesting, but more. Th and I'll, more slides to come. Other questions? Yeah. So you said that stress seems to activate uh, dynorphin release or at least kappa receptor activation throughout the brain. Right. And then previously you, you showed us how there was like a local sphere of dynorphin activity. So, you know, why, which is say going to contain dynorphin to its actions in the hippocampus if there was a local release in the hippocampus. So, you know, why should it be so local if 
the main role of dimorphism is the signal stress, for example. Why, why wouldn't it act as a, as a hormone that would go throughout the brain, maybe the way we think of oxytocin? You know, what's the point of having local signaling modes if stress activated everything? everything? Do you have an answer? I'm, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure that the circuits are always independent. The stressors that I'm looking at are pretty robust stressors. Four, 20 minutes, 15 minutes is for swim, uh, foot shock, um, social interactions that are very stressful. These are really robust, uh, kind of off-scale levels. But you could imagine lower levels of, of activation, um, where, for example, if you activate the dentate gyrus in a learning and memory task, you would have a, a local activation of dynorphin that would regulate the learning and memory task without necessarily recruiting pathways in other circuits. So just because they, in my systems, stress systems, activate broadly doesn't mean that they can't, in some other circumstances, act more locally, and I haven't defined those yet. So would that necessarily even be stress, or would, would that be some other signal? Well, you know, you, it's a really important th concept is, is what we call stress is really a fairly broad collection of, of experiences, some of which are dysphoric-genic, some of which are anxiogenic, some of which are actually a lot of fun. Skiing down a double black diamond uh, at Whistler is a lot of fun. Um, and so the, the, our reaction to what we, our body considers stressful uh, is very um, broad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so where am I? Um, okay, so dynorphin and CRF are both stress molecules, and they work in the brain in the ways that I've, I've described for you. Um, and CRF, when you inject CRF ICV, you can produce a condition place aversion that's blocked by Norby and I. This was a surprise to us because we think of, of CRF as being the dysphoric molecule, stress-induced release of CRF being dysphoric-genic. And the aversive quality of CRF act, uh, is actually blocked by Norby and I. So it says that it, the CRF experience requires dynorphin activation of kappa receptors in order for it to be... Uh, just for uh, perceived as the animal as aversive. And this experiment is in the dynorphin knockout animal. In fact, you can see ICV CRF actually produces a slight activation, a slight preference. And so, uh, as you would imagine, small amounts of CRF in the absence of dynorphin can actually be exciting. And we followed up on that in, in, other, in other studies, looking at the um, stimulating, the arousing effects of CRF. So CRF is not, when we think about stress and CRF, yeah, they're together. But stress is a complex response, some of which is aversive, some of which is anxiogenic, some of which is actually rewarding and exciting. Uh, here's a condition, uh, here's an open arm showing uh, CRF induced uh, reluctance to enter in, into the open arm, reduction in open arm time. CRF uh, anxiogenic effects are also blocked by Norby and I uh, in this system and are attenuated in the dynorphin knockout animal. Uh, okay, so all the stuff that I've been telling you so far has been based on condition place preference. And, and every time I submit my grants on condition place preference, inevitably somebody who only does self-administration says, well, that's uninterpretable. Show me something that I can appreciate, which is self-administration. So we, uh, Pete Grabowski joined the lab and he started doing experiments with rat self-administration and asked, what happens when we swim our rats during cocaine self-administration sessions. And what he found was that animals would learn how to self-administer cocaine just fine. When he swum the animals during, or just prior to a self-administration session, he, in his paradigm, did not see any elevation of, of the rate of escalation, but he did see a re, uh, big change in the, the cost, the animal's willingness to pay uh, for the self-administration. So this is a, a method that um, Roberts and Olison developed looking at something like a, play, a break point where within one session, each time the animal uh, presses for an infusion, the next time they get less drug. And so less drug, less drug, less drug, and eventually they'll quit. What happens with animals, will, they will reach that kind of break point and then they'll just stop working for the cocaine because they're not getting enough uh, with each infusion. 
But if we take animals that have been shown repeatedly for a swim, they show an increase in the amount of work that they will do, and they show a reduction in that attenuation. So it's a equivalent to a within-session increase in breakpoint. Uh, you can see it graphed uh, in this way, too, the y-axis. The x-axis is, is in opposite scale, but more familiar to you. Um, and then you can see in this that uh, when the animals are stressed, they increase the uh, work that they're willing to do for the uh, cocaine, and that this is blocked by Norby and I. Okay, so not only are we talking about increasing the rewarding effects in condition place preference, we're also seeing similar things in cocaine self-administration. I didn't describe it for you, but we've done parallel studies with alcohol and with nicotine and with, uh, with those three. And so we find very similar stress-induced potentiation of nicotine reward uh, by, by mechanisms, cellular mechanisms that are interesting and slightly different, but uh, I'm going to skip over that for now to get to some other stuff. Okay, so what do we know so far? Stress-induced dysphoric measured as aversion, and anxiety-like behaviors are measured, are mediated by CRF-induced activation of dynorphin kappa system. Norby and I specifically blocks the aversion and anxiety-like behaviors, but doesn't affect learning. We went and did careful studies. I told you about dynorphin in the hippocampus, and there, it could potentially interfere with the associative learning involved in these processes. We, we, we did some studies to eliminate that. And, but we wanted to ask, how does dynorphin produce these pro-addictive properties? Yeah. Um, it's really just based on your assay. Mm -hmm. So um, the way we would do that is, is what timing do you look at? So when you're looking at an anxiety assay, you're really looking at an acute response. You put the animal in a, in a stressed, stressing environment, then you put them in the elevated plus maze, and you ask, what's your behavior now? Uh, if you were to wait a day, the behavior would be back to normal. So the anxiety would be an acute response to the stressor. But for aversion, what we're doing is we're stressing them, and then conditioning them, and then testing a week later. And we're asking, what do you remember about the associated cues, the olfactory cue or the chamber that they were in, and, and are you going to avoid those? Do you remember that that was bad and avoid it? So we talk about aversion in that case, and it's not an acute response. It's a, um, it's a, a learned response. Uh, but it's also clear to us that different circuits are likely to involve uh, and, and regulate the aversive properties of stress and the um, anxiogenic effects of stress. The principal anxiogenic locus is in the basal lateral amygdala, is in the whole amygdala structures, and everybody focuses on those kinds of structures when they look at, at, at uh, anxiety behaviors. What I'm going to tell you in a moment is that the kappa-induced aversion behaviors are more complicated and may involve other brain structures, including the dorsal raphe serotonergic input, and direct effects within the VTA. But let me get to that in a moment. But th the answer to your question is, you can do it be, by, by your assay design, and you can resolve it based on the circuits involved in, in regulating the behavior. But ultimately, whenever we do behavioral pharmacology, we're just guessing what the animal is feeling. We're pretending like we know and calling it something. And we hope that it's all internally consistent, but we really don't know what the animal is doing. All we know is what they're showing us in, by their behavior. Okay? It's not a, it's, it was not a, a s simple question at all. <coughs> I told you about the signaling that we spent a lot of time looking at. And I told you that these membrane delimited effects are largely responsible for the um, presynaptic inhibition and likely for the acute effects, including actions on the... Um, um, uh, analgesic effects. But we wanted to ask what other kinds of signaling were involved in some of these more complex behavioral response. And when we did a, d a series of studies that I've, I, I've, I won't describe for you, what we found is that it was the activation of P38 that seemed to be most important for the dysphoric properties of the uh, cap agonists. Let me tell you a little bit about that. The first clue that we had that that was true was when we looked at animals in the ability to activate P38 versus ERK. This is ERK and this is P38. The P38 activation was blocked or missing in the GRK3 knockout. The G protein receptor kinase is the enzyme that phosphorylates that serine 369 necessary for arrest and recruitment. 
And arrest and recruitment is, is important not only to stop the G protein signaling, but arrest and recruitment is a scaffold that is necessary for P38 activation. And so when we block that uh, with GRK3 knockout, we block P38 activation. We then asked, is P38 important in the dysphoric effects? Here we're looking at, again, condition place aversion. And if we look at U50, the calf agonist, uh, injected uh, into the animal, we'll get lovely condition place aversion. But if we pre-inject with a P38 antagonist, we completely block U50-induced place aversion. It has no effect, the P38 has no effect on cocaine place preference. And so P38 seems to be important in both the GRK3 and pharmacologically in the aversive properties of cap activation. In a cartoon form, what we think is happening is that dinorphin can activate a G beta gamma to regulate ion channels, but when it activates the G protein receptor kinase 3, phosphorylates this residue, arrestin binds, arrestin dependent signaling results in P38 activation and aversion, and there's a series of studies that go through all of the logic behind that analysis. And I, you can find them if you want to know more about the controls. We're happy to answer any questions about them. But it's really interesting. What that said to us was that we might be able to separate drugs that activate this pathway without activating this pathway. Why would we think that? Well, in other systems, for example, the mu opioid receptor system, morphine is really good at that. Morphine is really good at activating the G-beta gamma signaling, but really lousy at, at causing arrest and recruitment. That's what these guys told us. And so the idea that there could be a morphine-like drug in the kappa system that would produce analgesia without dysphoria or aversion seemed really uh, promising. Where in the brain is, are these happening? So I told you about that antibody that we generated, and we, and we have another tool that we're using in this study, which is norbionine. Let me take a minute to describe that for you. It's a kappa-selective antagonist. One of the unusual things about norbionine, I've been known for 25 years after Phil Portuguese synthesized it, is if you inject an animal one time with norbionine, it took weeks for the drug effect to wear off. And, and this was really a puzzle, but in this study, we used it for our advantage. If you inject it, you can locally inactivate the cap receptors for weeks, which lets us do all sorts of behavioral studies, which showed, allowed us to look at where in the brain we could inject norbionide to block, um, uh, block condition place aversion. And, and it turns out the, the answer is a lot of places. Aversion is complicated, a lot of places. But here's a study where it was, we injected it into the dorsal raphe nucleus, a principal serotonergic structure, and we were able to block the condition place aversion. Uh, these are control experiments showing us that the uh, local injection really did act locally and that it didn't diffuse broadly. We are able to do that because after the injection was done, the drug's effect is, is lasts for weeks, we could inject the animal with a cap agonist and see where ERK activation occurred, and it would occur everywhere except where the cap receptors had been inactivated. Um, not in the receptor itself. So the receptor itself, the protein levels are stable. So unlike many of the mono and monoergic systems where a, an antagonist would actually increase the level of a protein, the opioid systems don't regulate that way. It's, it's fortunate, but it's um, it, it be for us because it makes our analysis simpler. If you were to do the same experiment with propranolol, you'd see upregulation or any of the serotonergic receptor uh, antagonist, you'd see dramatic changes in receptor expression. We don't see any changes in either dynorphin message level, dynorphin actions, dynorphin itself, or in uh, kappa receptors, except that the, although the protein is there at the same level, it's inactive. I'll get to that in a moment. Maybe yes, in the second. I don't think that's a silly question at all. <laughs> I haven't heard any silly, really I haven't heard any silly questions thing. at all. Yeah. It's really important. Okay, so, um, okay, we got the receptors Inactivated, we know that if we put um, kappa receptor antagonist norbionite into the DRN, we can block aversion. What if we took a kappa receptor knockout animal, inject it with a lentiviral construct that allows it to express the kappa receptor? This is the kappa receptor in the wild type form. This is the kappa receptor with that serine 
that's important in restin recruitment mutated from serine to alanine so it can no longer recruit a restin. Let's go ahead and put those two receptors into animal, kappa knockout animals, and see what happens. The answer is that if we put the wild type kappa receptor back into the kappa knockout animal, we recover aversion to the same level as a wild type animal. Here's the kappa knockout failing to show aversion. If we put in a control vector, we don't get aversion. If we put in the mutated form of the kappa receptor, we don't recover aversion at all either. The kappa receptor that's mutated is functional, though, because it can clearly uh, recover other behaviors. So aversion seems to require kappa receptor activation in the dorsal raphe nucleus and phosphorylation by the G-protein receptor kinase and arrest and recruitment. That's kind of interesting. Yes. <laughs> so exactly the exactly the point. Brigitte brings out uh, not a stupid question either. Exactly the right point, which is when you inject into a brain structure in a mouse and you claim you're hitting the dorsal raphe nucleus, you're obviously not only hitting the dorsal raphe nucleus, you're also hitting other. Uh, at other cells that are nearby, and how do you know it's selective? And the answer is, in the dorsal raphe, there are serotonergic neurons. It's not a homogeneous structure. There are non-serotonergic neurons. There are a variety of neural afferents. There are astrocytes, all of which would have their kappa receptors inactivated by local injection of Norby and I, many of which would recover their expression when you uh, inject the virus. Can we distinguish these components? Well, of course, we can use a conditional knockout strategy. Uh, I just put this up to explain how it's not a trivial strategy. You've got to do a lot of generations of breeding. And what we did in this series of studies was we took the P38 alpha isoform, floxed, and then we excised P38 alpha only in subpopulations of cells that expressed Cre under control of various markers that we wanted to uh, develop. And so the results here are, these are controls. We can show that we can inactivate P38 in the, with EPET promoter, which is a, a serotonergic selective um, promoter, with CERT, the transporter, the reuptake transporter, which is expressed by those cells, but not with the P38, uh, without, with the CRE driven by uh, astrocyte promoter. And so we can get that. Uh, and no changes in... Um, in non-TPH positive cells. So we're getting selective inactivation of P38 alpha signaling in the serotonergic neurons of the dorsal raphe nucleus. What behavioral effects did we see? Well, that blocked the aversion with this promoter, blocked the aversion with this promoter, failed to affect promote, uh, aversion with this promoter. So it seems as if the P38 activation by kappa in the serotonergic TPH immunoreactive cells was essential for the condition place aversion uh, that we were, we were studying. Well, what other behaviors? Aversion is an important behavior, uh, but what about other interesting behaviors that we could study? Um, this is a study that we did when we, when we took animals in a social defeat assay. If you take, you know this assay probably, but if you take an intruder mouse and put it in with an aggressive mouse, maybe the aggressive mouse, that was its home cage, maybe it had a litter of pups there. If you put the intruder mouse in there, they will act socially. Uh, the aggressor will defend its territory, attack the intruder. The intruder knows it's in the wrong space, especially if you stack the cards against the intruder by making him a little smaller than the aggressor. Uh, that intruder will show a series of characteristic defeat postures like a puppy dog will when it's, when it's, when it's meeting an aggressive uh, older animal. They'll roll over on their back and they will signal, I'm not really here to threaten you, I will get away as soon as I can. And it saves a lot of animal death. It's important social uh, behavior that we, we humans do as well. If, you do, if you're really cruel and you do that to the mouse repeatedly, they will develop social defeat behaviors really quickly and show much more of the time. They will develop an increase in social defeat behaviors if you treat them to the social defeat experience multiple times. If you pre-treat the animal with Norby and I or take a dynorphin knockout animal, they show normal defeat behaviors, but they fail to show that escalation in defeat behaviors. Dynorphin is really important in that escalation of defeat. 
And you can anthropomorphize generously and say, this is really important for humans because if you get repeatedly defeated in a context, it changes the way you interact, it changes your, your approach, and this is a hyper-stressed animal. If you take that animal and you put it into an interaction chamber, uh, in the interaction chamber, it should be very familiar to those of you who read Eric Nestor's work who looks at, at this uh, as well. If you take a wild-type animal, no stress, and you put him into an interaction chamber with a uh, strange animal right in, in a, another enclosure, he will go and spend a lot of time exploring who that other animal is. If you stress a wild-type animal and put him in there just like this, they will avoid that intruder. Uh, they will avoid that novel animal. If you pretreat the animal with Norby and I, they'll be, that will be blocked. And if you excise P38 and stress them, it will also be blocked. So stress-induced social avoidance is also regulated by the serotonergic uh, kappa activation of the P38 mechanism. These are representative data. These are average data. You can see the same effect there. Um, Stress-induced reinstatement. This is in a condition place as preference assay. Condition the animal to cocaine in a chamber, and then you extinguish that preference. You can reinstate the preference in one of three ways. You can stress the animal, which is what we do here. You can give a drug priming. Um, there's a third way that I've forgotten. Um, Q, and, and a Q-induced, you can do that as well. If you stress-induced reinstatement, a wild-type animal will reinstate, but the um, animals that have the uh, P38 excised will not show stress-induced reinstatement. They learn cocaine for its preference just fine, and if you prime them by giving them a cocaine injection, priming-induced reinstatement is normal in those animals. Um, these are control experiments on other behaviors, analgesia, locomotion, and elevated plus, where the animals, uh, these are behaviors that are not affected by kappa, uh, by excision of P38. Okay, so what do we know so far? Kappa receptor activation, um, Gosh, is it really quarter to 12? I'm just zooming. I'm just really going slowly. I'm going to talk a little longer, if that's okay. Um, okay, so we've got um, these. these I, oh, okay, great. Then let me go. Let me go. <laughs> let me keep going. Um, so what are the, I'm interested in the mechanisms. I'm a molecular pharmacologist. I'm really interested in the mechanisms. What's going on? Uh, is there any way that uh, we can explain what the P38 is doing? And, and Randy Blakely and Ramamurthy's labs had looked at P38 regulation of the plasma membrane serotonin transporter, and this made it logical <coughs> sense that this could be a, a good target for the P38 activation by kappa receptor. So we asked the question, could kappa receptor activation of P38 affect 5-HT transport? To do that experiment, what we did was we isolated synaptosomes from mice that had either been stressed or not stressed, and then in a cuvette where we could measure using uh, really uh, uh, very powerful kinetic measures, we could measure the rate of depletion of serotonin in the cuvette uh, as a function of transport into the synaptosomes. This is a rotating disk electrode. This, the electrode can sample electrochemically the uh, concentration of serotonin in the cuvette. And what we do is in this experiment, once it's stabilized, uh, we squirt in some serotonin at a known concentration, and we watch it being taken up by the synaptosomes. And that if we do the same experiment with a different set of uh, synaptosomes in the presence of peroxidine, there's a difference. So that difference, peroxidine-sensitive serotonin uptake, is mediated by the serotonin transporter. If you take a serotonin transport knockout animal, there is no peroxidine-sensitive uptake, and that's good control. If we stress the animals repeatedly prior to isolating the synaptosomes, we see an increase in the rate of transport uh, that's blocked by Norby and I, and it recovers after a few hours. And so it seems as if one of the things that could be happening is that kappa receptor activation increases serotonergic transport in the nerve terminal. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense because a hyposerotonergic state would be fairly dysphorogenic. That's why SSRIs are good antidepressants. So we think that this might be a reasonable idea. Uh, because of the power of the electrochemical detection, you can test different concentrations of, of monoamine, and you can uh, do Michaelis-Menten kinetics, which 
um, my biochemistry professor from my undergraduate years would love to know that I do. And, and you can measure Vmax, uh, Vmax and Km. And you, what you can see is that the serotonin transporter K, Vmax is affected, but the Km is not. What's really interesting is you can adjust the inhibitors in the, uh, in the cuvette, and you can add dopamine instead. And you can see that the same stress does not affect dopamine transport. And there's a third category of uptake uh, through uh, a, a, low, a low affinity, high uh, capacity OCT transporter, and these are not influenced as well either. So we get a selective effect on surface expression of the serotonin transporter measured by Michaelis Menten kinetics. And we can also measure the same thing by doing Western blots. If you biotinylate the synaptosomes and isolate the biotinylated surface proteins and then blot with an anti cert uh, you can see an, an increase in the amount of surface expression. This is true with the four swim. It's true with cap agonism uh, with drug, and it's also true with social defeat, as shown by that image as well. Okay, so we got an idea now that in the brain there is an increase in surface expression. Cap receptors, I told you, are really everywhere. And what's interesting about the dorsal raphe nucleus is it projects broadly to the forebrain. And so we asked, I expected uh, that it would be kind of global. I was surprised when my graduate student, Abby Schindler, found that it was only significantly increased surface expression in the ventral striatum. That was, that was not, I mean, it makes sense in hindsight, but it was a surprise. It, where is the highest density of dynorphin input to a serotonergic terminal? It's in the ventral striatum where all of those medium spiny neurons are filled with dynorphin. This is after the stress, uh, within 30 to 60 minutes. The brains are isolated, okay, dissected, right. right away, right away. And if you wait three to four hours, it's, it's back to normal. It's a transient increase in the level of a serotonin transporter in a P38 dependent manner that relaxes within six hours. Any manipulation can make it uh, appear after days or weeks? We haven't done that. Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly, but if you wanted to do repeated stress over the course of the week, would it stay up forever? I don't know that. We didn't do those experiments. These were all um, two days of stress. So because one day of stress. Because, because your trigger might regurgitate dorsal stress or ventral stress. I'm wondering ah. if you had a longer right. stress, better manipulation, and you look later on if you would see swing. Absolutely interesting question. Absolutely, a really interesting question. I think that that's, um, I think that that's very possible. Very, considering what we know about the transition uh, from ventral to, to dorsal, uh, I think it would be very interesting to follow up on that. That's a good, good is, idea. Is anyone going to be talking about that in the course? The, the, this yeah. idea about how there's how information processing in the, between dorsal and ventral. Yes. I think it's really important. We haven't done anything like that, but that's an uh, interesting extension. The question I ask, though, is, okay, now we, where is dynorphin working? Um, is it, we know that we, we have dynorphin in the dorsal raphe. We know that we have dynorphin in the nerve terminals. We're seeing change in transporter at the nerve terminals. Is that because of a dynorphin action up in the cell bodies that somehow gets transmitted to the terminals, or is there local action? So what we did was we locally injected Norby and I in the, near the terminals or up in the cell bodies, and what we found is that we would get a block of the translocation of, of surface cert only if we put the Norby and I at the nerve terminals. Okay. So that says it's, it's likely to be locally acting, and um, here's an image showing that with the core P staining that there's a tremendous amount of dynorphin activation of kappa receptors after CRF exposure. We think that those receptors are activated by local dynorphin released from the medium spiny neurons. And so I've got a cartoon summarizing what we think is going on. What I think is happening is the medium spiny neurons of the direct pathway that, that are rich in dynorphin release dynorphin locally. 
Um, they also send their projections to other structures, BTA, et cetera, but locally they will activate uh, through collaterals activation of kappa receptors on these serotonergic nerve terminals. Uh, and we know that when they do so, they activate P38, which causes the serotonin transporter to, to transiently insert into the, um, into the nerve terminal, enhancing reuptake kinetics, causing a transient hyposertonergic state. And we postulate that stress-induced dysphoria may result from a local hyposertonergic state. So do you, what do you think activates those MSM cells? Is it dopamine? I would. I don't know. I would guess glutamate. Of some from some stress-induced release of glutamate would activate those cells, but we haven't proven. Dopamine is released by some cells. But whether dopamine would cause the release of dynorphin, I don't know. Yeah. Um, other people could speculate about that. But this is why I asked you, George, about the serotonergic uh, component of your cartoons and how you should revise your 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 next uh, summary cartoon to include the important role of serotonin in the. Uh, addictive properties of uh, pro-addictive properties of of stress, because clearly the serotonergic system has a key role in cocaine, and as I said, probably ethanol and uh, nicotine as well. Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but what about dopamine? This is in here for you, George. What about dopamine? Um, well, my heart is beating. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that That's if you look. <laughs> if you put if you put Norby and I into the DRN, you block uh, the dynorphin regulation of the serotonergic system. But if we we found that if you put Norby and I into the VTA, you also can block uh, condition place aversion. So aversion is a really complicated phenomenon, and I'm not quite sure exactly what we what aversion is is caused by in an animal. But you could imagine, if you just think about why you would not want to be in this room ever again, um, too many boring talks would be one, um, uh, electric foot shock on your chair would be, uh, would be another, uh, if it smelled really badly in here, if you got sick from the lunch. There were lots of reasons why you might avoid this space. And so when we think about animal-induced showing us aversion, when we think about aversion and we thought, think about it as a single unitary thing, we're obviously grossly oversimplifying. And cap receptors, as I told you, activate anxiogenic as well as dysphoric as well as other kinds of actions. And the idea that different kinds of uh, local injections might influence the behaviors that we see just simply reminds us that we're being simplistic in our thinking if we try to imagine that place aversion is, is one emotion. It's not. And so we did this experiment. I showed you this result earlier with the lentiviral injection into the DRN. I'm repeating it to show you that the exact same data uh, can, be emerge, can, can emerge if you locally inject the kappa lentivirus into the VTA and restore expression of kappa receptors in a kappa knockout, but in, a, um, in, the, in the ventral tegmental area. And so we're still trying to understand what the regulation of the dopamine system by kappa does to... Uh, the rewarding effects of cocaine, and uh, just to tell you that the simple story that we described is not um, not quite not quite complete. If we excise p thirty eight alpha with a DAT dopamine transporter driven Cree, just like when we excise it in the TPH uh, serotonergic, we can also block a uh, condition place aversion, and that says that in the ventral tegmental area, a P38 regulated mechanism is also involved in aversion by mechanisms that we need to describe better. Um, if, if you were to look at any one of the major uh, cartoons, starting from DTR, the idea that kappa receptor activation is aversive <coughs> would be explained by the presynaptic inhibition of dopamine at the nerve terminals. Um, and when we look at that using fast scan cyclic voltammetry uh, record shown here uh, and stimulating by the medium forebrain bundle or the PPTG, we can get a lovely kappa induced inhibition of dopamine release measured by fast scan voltammetry. But it's not P38 dependent. It's not blocked in the DAT knockout, uh, conditional knockout, and it's not blocked in a slice when we inject the P38 antagonist. So we're in a, a bit of a, a conundrum here. The dominant theory is that presynaptic inhibition by kappa, by the membrane-delimited actions that Mark was asking about earlier, uh, 
is likely to be uh, is assumed to be important in uh, the dysphoric effects, and you can show by dialysis and voltammetry that dopamine release is inhibited, but that's not responsible for the p38 dependent regulation of aversion. Something else is. We don't know yet what it is, but something else is. Okay. Aversion is a complex circuit response. This is the kind of summary. Wrap it up uh, for this part. Talk. Kappa mediated p30 activation DRN projections produce a transient hyposterinergic state. Uh, P38 activation in dopamine neurons produces aversion as well by mechanisms that we are in the process of defining. But presynaptic inhibition of dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which is not P38 dependent, may not be important in core dependent aversion. Something else may be. Okay. So I'm going to take a break now, if that's okay, and um, then go to part two uh, after you maybe had a chance to walk around and stretch. Okay. Yeah, questions. So, Charlie, one issue regarding inhibition, right, as you mentioned, medium time neurons are driven by glutamatergic inputs mm -hmm. from the down state to the up state, and they can already fire. Okay. So, what we know in the shed is that dopamine will increase firing, right? So, you will have more, right? but inhibiting dopamine might not be as effective as. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's really an interesting idea. Uh, it's a good good suggestion. Do the VTA dopamine projections only release dopamine? I I wondered whether they might also release glutamate, and and in which case it would be confounded by the co-release of glutamate, which would also be um, regulated by kappa receptors. I don't know whether any of those are p38 regulated. You may not know, but Tom Cash has done some studies with, with these mice looking in the amygdala, and what he finds is that the release of GABA in the amygdala may be P38 dependent. And so there may be other s transmitters other than dopamine that are important in this response. And so it could be that it's not dopamine release that's important for the aversion, but it's the inhibition of glutamate release in a P38 dependent manner uh, that's important in this circuit. Yes. Second, you could use dopamine antagonists yeah. to just remove the dopamine component of the VTA activation yes. and see whether that right. changes the right. effect. So right. somehow you could get a good answer and close yes. this chapter one yeah. way or another. It doesn't really make yeah. sense. So you, you know Richard Palmer generated a dopamine deficient animal. Tom Nasco published quite a bit about that. And what he what what Tom did with me was to show that depletion of dopamine with that animal failed to block aversion. And so it was as the data, which is complicated because of the, dif the difficulties of interpreting results with that mouse, um, uh, it suggests that it's not dopamine, it may be something else. Actually, so it fits on Earth. And it's really interesting because you can associate the role 
So it's really nice to put a demo on and a draw in yeah. the version versus the GA, the direct simulation of the GA, and dopamine to play a really key role in regulating the version for exactly that reason. It helps you learn that that was bad and to avoid the simulation. Right. It's a good thing. But Malenka's got a really nice story. Instead of the VGA to a compass, the VGA to two point cortex. So it could be dopamine in some different sites. So that could be one yeah. possible. I don't know if, if everybody in the, in the room is really catching what they're saying. I think it's really, really important. What they're describing is, is the evolution of our thinking where 20 years ago we just thought less dopamine was bad, more dopamine is good, and now we're getting to a more sophisticated understanding of, of what dopamine is really doing. It's not simply a rheostat saying how, much, how big our smile needs to be. It's something else entirely. And so when we think about aversion, the dominant models are kappa inhibits dopamine. That must mean that's why it's bad are obviously inadequate. We need to revise our models with more sophisticated thinking and, and get involved, other circuits involved, including the habanula, and I would argue including the, um, the serotonergic inputs from the, from the dorsal raphe. Okay. Question, other questions? Because we can take a break whenever we're done and go on to the next. Great.